Welcome to Postcards, a brief look at people, places, the arts and curiosities from around the world. On today's program, a festival of music, seafood and things maritime. Mucking about on boats at Europe's largest boat show. One hundred faces of the century photographic exhibition. Specimens collected by Charles Darwin on display for the first time. And the Victoria and Albert Museum looks at its own history. But first up, from the traditional to the modern, London can claim to have it all. And for one weekend, there's a rare chance to look into the public buildings, offices, homes and gardens of the capital. London's Open House Weekend is a celebration of British architecture and design and an opportunity to encourage people to look at their environment, their buildings and to take back the streets of London for a weekend. This building itself is typical of the new architecture of London. It's the home of architects Paxton and Locker in Clerkenwell Green in London's East End. This specifically designed building features a magnificent light well. The whole building is a hymn to light and space in a confined area. The practice employs about 15 people. The reception area is impressive. The house and offices were built only five years ago. It's also a private home where the two architects live with their family. Some 500 of the capital's buildings are open, free of charge. It's an opportunity to sample the hidden delights behind the public facade and discover a London that's full of surprises. Meanwhile, the last of the capital's summer festivals allows one last chance to mess about in boats before the winter sets in. While Southampton and Earl's Court usually corner the market in British boating extravaganzas, London on Water claims to be just a bit more. A festival of seafood, music and all things maritime that emphasises London's waterways as a happening place. While the east end of London, the old Docklands, has undergone enormous rejuvenation in recent years, many still see it as a place to commute to and from. The festival's aim is to encourage locals to appreciate the water and make better use of it. It's being promoted as a major venue around the world and as a filming location. For enthusiasts, there's upwards of 400 private and exhibition boats here. Canal narrow boats, cruisers and prestigious power boats like the Princess 60. With its luxurious lounge and all the comforts of home on board, a mere snip at just over $1.2 million US. For the yachty who can't bear to leave his other toy at home, the Dutton Commander will be a popular solution. It's an amphibious car which can be driven on water. The corrosion-proof craft reaches speeds of up to 90 miles per hour on land and 8 miles an hour on water. London's Waterways has ambitious plans for new moorings, even a floating hotel for the area, 
making it the marina of the millennium. And for the real boating fanatic looking for a leisure or travel alternative, the Southampton Boat Show is the largest show of its kind in Europe and certainly one of the busiest. Here there's a boat to suit every pocket, from the latest luxury yacht costing a cool $3.2 million US to a $480 US inflatable. For more than 30 years, the Southampton Boat Show has been a sensitive barometer of the British economy, measuring not only exports, but the nation's competitiveness in the wake of a strong pound. One manufacturer who's competed successfully in the world market is Sunseeker, based at Poole in Dorset. It specialises in luxury yachts, floating palaces dedicated to a champagne and caviar lifestyle. A spacious bedroom below. And a jacuzzi on the upper deck are all included here. Britain is also a world leader in fast powerboat design and production. Fletcher from Staffordshire is one of the most successful in Europe. Their boats are made for British and European waters and are popular as sports boats. There's a relaxed feel to the Southampton show. The site covers more than 25 acres with 800 craft from more than 600 exhibitors. And whether your interest is in sailing or powerboats, there's something for everyone from accessories to rope tying demonstrations. Reflecting the traditional British love affair with boats and boating, the show is expected to attract some 120,000 visitors and result in orders worth millions of pounds to Britain's ever buoyant marine industry. Britain's National Portrait Gallery recently exhibited an ambitious project which boldly tried to encapsulate the 20th century in 100 photographic studies. Ten British celebrities, among them singer David Bowie, Professor Stephen Hawking and filmmaker David Putnam, sifted through thousands of images and whittled them down to a choice of just ten each to best represent moments of importance to them since 1900. Lord Putnam's reflect the issue of tolerance in a multicultural society. He selected scenes from the arrival of Jamaican immigrants aboard the Windrush and images of British fascist leader Oswald Mosley, who was known for his rampant support for Adolf Hitler. Representing style and fashion for the millennium, designer Vivian Westwood shows icons from the movie world, including her namesake Vivian Lee and the more contemporary Eleanor Bonham Carter. Physicist Stephen Hawking said even though he didn't like some of her policies, he chose Margaret Thatcher because she had style. Paul Direct, who discovered antimatter, and Francis Crick, who unraveled the structure of DNA, were also obvious choices for Hawking. The portraits often say something about the people who chose them, but there were some surprises. Broadcaster and journalist Trevor Phillips chose events impacting on large numbers of people, like Sinn Féin leader Michael Collins addressing a Dublin rally in 1922, England's 1966 Football World Cup victory and Beatlemania. David Bowie chose an image of Sir John Logie Baird to represent the unfathomable importance of the Scots' most famous invention, television. His other choices include British comedian Max Wall and Irish playwright Samuel Beckett of Waiting for Godot fame. The impact of punk music was marked by two panellists. David Bowie chose a characteristic expression of the late Sid Vicious and Vivian Westwood remembered his fellow Sex Pistols band member Johnny Rotten. Interestingly, the exhibition suggests that our generation is probably most shaped by pin-ups, poets, playwrights and politicians.
This tongue-in-cheek painting by stage actress Nicola McAuliffe is part of a special art auction arranged by British charity Help the Aged to celebrate the United Nations Year of the Older Person. Celebrities like veteran sports presenter Jimmy Hill, who made this offering, were asked to create original work under the theme Images of Age. Some opted for a wry but light-hearted look at getting older, like these characters from the palette of This Is Your Life presenter Michael Aspel. While some preferred to portray an aspect from their profession, like children's presenter Floella Benjamin or TV chef Ainsley Harriet, who had a little help from his children Madeline and Jimmy. It's all meant to focus people's thoughts on the important role to be played by older people in the new millennium and to make use of this rich resource across the world of older experienced people who have a great deal to contribute to society. Actress Wendy Craig came up with this endearing image of the twilight years. And devotees of the long-running British comedy Dad's Army will appreciate this creation from the series actor Ian Lavender. Lavender aged Private Pike to show what he'd look like today. A photo of Lavender shows us how the actor himself looks at the turn of the century. To honour the elderly on an international scale, people of all ages also took part in Walk the World, a series of special events arranged in 60 countries across the globe. The sinking of the Titanic by the prize-winning novelist and part-time painter Beryl Bainbridge. Her work is just part of an exhibition showcasing the private daubings of politicians, eminent surgeons and scientists, writers and actors, even bankers. The exhibition, displaying the work of 26 artists, has been put together by the London School of Economics and Political Science. This colourful piece is by the comedian and writer Barry Humphreys, probably best known as Australian housewife superstar Dame Edna Everidge. British Prime Minister Tony Blair is the subject of this photograph, one of several by the politician Lord Healy. This is by one of the few exhibitors who went to art school, although the painter made a career in journalism, becoming the editor of a national newspaper. Internationally renowned theatre and opera director Jonathan Miller is currently preparing an individual exhibition of his collages. Simply signed Anne Norfolk, this painting is by the charity fundraiser, the Duchess of Norfolk. Her paintings have already raised considerable sums for the hospice movement in Britain. 50% of the proceeds from sales during the exhibition go to charity. The remainder goes to supporting art at the LSE. The blue plaque is a familiar sight on the facade of Britain's buildings. It signifies a famous politician, scientist or artist once lived or worked here. This one, on a house in West London, is a tribute to Britain's only world chess master, Howard Staunton. Staunton won against saint Amand in Paris in 1843. saint Amand was the French chess champion and was considered to be the world champion. Anyone who wanted to think themselves good in chess would have to beat him, and Staunton beat him convincingly. Staunton's interests went much wider than chess. He was an actor, an educational reformer and a writer about chess. He published new rules for the game, which enabled the first truly international tournament to take place in London. Staunton turned London into the chess centre of Europe. During the 19th century, Russian and German masters flocked to places like Simpsons on the Strand. Staunton's most lasting achievement, though, was to standardise the confusing array of chess figures into the distinctive knights, rooks and bishops familiar to chess players throughout the world today. He also had an eye to the future and played the first chess game electronically down a telegraph wire with the editor of the magazine he wrote for. A century and a quarter after Howard Staunton's death, his influence is still felt way beyond the confines of the world's chess playing salons where his name is familiar.
It's now possible to sail the Nile in search of amethysts and carnelian, find a way into the depths of an Egyptian temple and meet the goddesses Tawarat and Hathor face to face. Capitalising on the abiding popularity of the ancient Egyptians, the British Museum's Educational Multimedia Unit has unveiled a new website aimed specifically at school children in years five and six and their teachers. The website contains information about life, culture, beliefs and practices in ancient Egypt using objects from the museum's collections, animation and 3D models. Each story is structured in three ways, a narrative story, a self-guided explore and an interactive challenge. There's also an area for teachers, referred to as a staff room, containing resources for teachers including background information, discussion topics, worksheets and classroom activities. Egypt is the first in a series of websites on ancient civilizations. The museum plans to cover Mesopotamia, India and China in the future. The new technology aims to bring the museum's collections and its educational expertise to a wider British and worldwide audience. A rare opportunity to see the actual specimens collected by Charles Darwin that brought him to his controversial theories of evolution. Voyages of Discovery at London's Natural History Museum showcases treasures gathered on Britain's great sea voyages by the Endeavour, the Beagle and the Investigator, among others. They've never been seen by the public before. The beaks of Darwin's finches on the Galapagos Islands admirably demonstrate natural selection. Adapting to their environment to avoid competing for the same food, the birds developed different shaped bills over successive generations to exploit various food sources. Yet the exhibition is more than just an astounding collection. Researchers at the museum say that the more research is done, the more it's discovered there is left to do. Captain James Cook's voyage to the Pacific in the Endeavour in 1768 was the first time a dedicated natural history crew was included. An enthusiastic Joseph Banks was so delighted by the range of unusual plant life in Australia, he named the landfall Botany Bay. Artist Sidney Parkinson made nearly 1,000 sketches and paintings of new flora and fauna before he died of dysentery and malaria contracted in Java. Banks' journal describes the first European sighting of a strange new animal, as large as a greyhound, of a mouse colour and very swift. Modern day botanists are still making new discoveries, but on a different scale. In the exhibition, one can sense the excitement that these people must have had as they found new things, things they knew no European had seen before. The documentation had to be pedantically correct in the days before photography, but it made for some very beautiful works of art. Sir Hans Sloane's cocoa plant from Jamaica in 1689 began Europe's fascination with chocolate. Sloan modified the West Indies' oily, bitter drink by boiling the beans in sugared milk and inventing the first chocolate drink. The importance of these precious artefacts, unique in themselves, lies in how they shape the understanding of the world as it was for the 17th century European mind. Is this your idea of how a museum should be? The Great Exhibition of 1851, which gave birth to the Victoria and Albert Museum. Or this. Queen Victoria would not be amused, but museums have changed and moved with the times to attract visitors, and the V&A is no exception. Instead of costumes being shown behind glass cases, leading British fashion designers display their creations on live models. Visitors can see beautifully dressed models walking through, for example, the sculpture court, giving a real sense of the relationship between contemporary design and historical artefacts. The sculpture with its life-size images from the Renaissance provides the perfect setting for the collision of old and new. This replica of Michelangelo's David offended Queen Victoria's sensibilities when it was first unveiled. So a cover-up was ordered. The fig leaf is just one of the more unusual exhibits in a grand design, which traces a history and perceptions of the Victoria and Albert. 
the pick of a vast collection from all over the world. The Far East, and Shiva's bull from India. The museum is a guardian of the British national heritage. A landseer is just one of the unexpected treasures. And there's some excellent English pottery like this porcelain terrain. One of the great constable paintings, Salisbury Cathedral. The exhibition asks us what the museum is for and how it evolves. Right from the start, the museum was intended to attract a wide public. It began with the Great Exhibition of 1851, which attracted huge crowds. It was intended to be a place of spectacle for a wide audience. There's something for everybody. This rare Matisse print with its original plate is just one example from the millions of artefacts housed in the Victoria and Albert collection. Some inspired other artists. This 16th century mirror was used by a Victorian artist in a portrait of Donatello. The museum also has an important role as a contemporary showcase. Modern classics like this Charles Rennie Mackintosh chair capture the essence of Art Nouveau. And a collection of Bakelite radios from the 50s seem to sum up a period. Above all, a museum is a changing institution. This multimedia installation looks towards the museum's future and its new spiral building. Fashion is both for display and a living exhibit. A grand design captures the roles of a great museum as an educator, treasure house, archive, guardian of the national heritage and contemporary patron. And that's all for today. Join us again next time for a postcard look at interesting people, places and the arts.